you don't always need a cluster of servers to perform parallel processing. Sometimes you can just use your laptop. Let's take a look at how this became possible. A CPU's clock speed tells us how often instructions can be processed. Represented here are clock speeds of various CPUs from manufacturers like Intel and AMD. Their speeds increased by orders of magnitude, from millions per second to billions per second. A linear trend line through the early years shows that during this period of dramatic speed boosting, the same program code could run much faster by simply running it on a newer CPU. But when we bend the trend line to fit the entire time span, we can see that the rate of change decreased during the latter years. Increasing speed was no longer worth the cost in terms of power consumed and heat dissipated. When I overlay a second y-axis, you can see why the number of instructions performed per second could continue to rise even though speed decreased. It's because work, once done by a single processor, was now divided among several processing cores. The logical processors in red represent the number of physical cores multiplied by the number of threads each core can handle. Here's an example of the benefits of multi-core architecture. If we reduce speed but add a second compute core, we increase the amount of work that can be done per second while decreasing electricity usage and generating less heat, thus increasing the longevity of the chip. The downside is that programs no longer ran faster just because they ran on a newer CPU. To increase performance, their code would need to be rewritten to use a parallel framework. In the early days of computing, just one program at a time could be executed on a massive computer that contained one processor. There was no overlap in processing. Another program could not start until the previous program stopped. Concurrency is when the execution of two or more tasks act as if they are running at the same time. But since a single core processor can really only run one program at a time, the CPU switches quickly between different tasks many times per second, giving it only the illusion of doing multiple things at once. Computer concurrency is like human multitasking. We are wired to be monotaskers, meaning that in most situations, our brains can only focus on one task at a time. When we think we're doing multiple things concurrently, we're actually task switching, just like a single core CPU. Concurrent does not mean parallel. True parallel processing requires multiple computational units. This could be multiple cores in a CPU or multiple computers connected together. A Spark cluster is an example of using many computers to enable parallel processing, whether these are physical servers in your data center or virtual nodes in the cloud. The technique is the same. A massive data set is chopped into small chunks and the data is distributed across many computers so that they can be processed simultaneously. Parallel computation can be performed on your laptop when it contains a CPU with multiple cores, like most all modern computers do. A CPU is implemented on an integrated circuit with multiple cores on a single chip, each of which reads instructions and processes data. Similar to how data is processed by a Spark cluster, chunks of data are distributed across the multiple cores inside your laptop. I will be demonstrating this by using a Python package named Dask, which manages the parallel execution of functions over these chunks. Dask integrates well with many popular Python packages, and a few are listed here but Dask is most often used for its Pandas-like DataFrame API, which is very familiar to those who analyze and engineer data. I use the synthetic data generator to build a large tabular data set, which contains person demographics and employment data.
Here are a few of the columns from a sample of rows that I loaded into a data frame. The data frame's row and column structure is similar to having the same data in a relational table and in a spreadsheet. Data frames are used by several technologies. Even though Python was created earlier, the R programming language had data frames first. The Pandas package gave data frame capabilities to Python, then Dask and Spark followed with their own versions of data frames. Development of Python began long before the multi-core trend, so Python and most of its packages are single-threaded and cannot leverage multiple cores. Pandas is one of these single-threaded packages, and it also operates entirely in memory. So let's use it to see what life was like before parallel processing. My test dataset is stored on my laptop inside one Linux directory that contains 10 subdirectories, one for each of 10 years. And there are 32 Parquet files in each subdirectory, representing data spread across the 12 months in each year. So the full dataset contains 320 files with a total of 200 million records spread across 120 months. Now we'll see what happens when we try to load this data into a pandas data frame. I ran a series of programs with each trying to load one additional month's worth of data. My laptop has 32 Gibby bytes of RAM installed and about 30 of them are available to my program with the rest being used by Linux and Python. Pandas took three and a half seconds to decompress and deserialize three Parquet files and load the first month of data into a data frame that consumed two and a half Gibby bytes of RAM. Now we'll see how much memory was used to load each additional month into a Pandas data frame. For Pandas to work, all of the data must fit into RAM. The program that attempted to load 13 months of data completed successfully in 36 seconds, but nearly all of my RAM was used up. When I ran a program to try to load 14 months of data, my laptop completely ran out of memory and swap space, so Linux invoked its out-of-memory killer to end my program, reclaim the RAM, and prevent a laptop crash. Here's a graphic representation of how many months worth of data I was able to successfully load into a Pandas data frame. And here's a look at how many records were successfully loaded. I used up all my RAM after loading only about 10% of the records, so I would have needed a lot more memory to load the entire dataset. But that doesn't even include the RAM I would need to actually work with the data. According to the original creator of Pandas, a good rule of thumb to follow is to have 5 to 10 times as much RAM as the size of your dataset if you want to avoid memory management problems. So I would really need a tremendous amount of RAM to successfully process my dataset using single-threaded pandas. This is why we need a solution like Dask. Python allows only one thread to have control of its interpreter, but Dask gets around this by running a Python interpreter on each core, and it avoids loading the entire dataset into memory by reading small chunks from disk performing the necessary processing, and then throwing away intermediate data as soon as possible. Let's look at a few simple code examples. Here, I'm defining a Dask data frame by providing the name of my high-level directory. Like Spark, Dask does lazy operations, so no processing occurs until I request a result by calling the compute method in the next statement. Here I'm asking for the top 10 most frequent last names among all 200 million records. Like Spark, Dask builds a task graph to coordinate the execution of parallel functions. Here's a small excerpt of the graph produced by my top 10 last names code. Each circle on the graph is a Python function, and this graph has six layers of functions. The first three layers call 320 functions because my dataset contains 320 Parquet files. And then the tree is reduced down to one function in the last three layers. 
Since my laptop contains eight cores, the graph shows eight files being processed at the same time. Here's a look at the output of my top 10 last name code. It took Dask 26 seconds to produce the result from all 200 million records. Compare this to Pandas, where it took 36 seconds to load just 10% of my data before it failed. This next example is a little more complex and requires a seven-layer task graph to produce a list of the top 10 first and last names. My final example requires a 14-layer task graph. First, I calculate each person's age. Then I compute the average salary by gender for people between the age of 30 and 60. And DAS successfully distributes the parallel computation across the cores of my laptop to produce the answer. The next time you need to explore a new large data set, try to do it with your laptop first. DASK is free to use, and it doesn't require a connection to a network to get work done.